outward flows. And um, this classic hybrid, so hybrid too. And uh, the theme this week or month is fall and winter seasonal vegetables. And with the holidays coming up, I thought I would do um, some kind of more impressive looking stuffed vegetables. Um, so the two recipes we have are the stuffing stuffed pumpkin and uh, stuffed cabbage cake, I think is what I ended up calling it. <laughs> Um, the samples are probably running together a little bit on your plate, but uh, I'll show you what we're making and hopefully it'll make sense what you're eating. Um, so what kind of vegetables do we think of when we think of fall? Let's see them now. Squash. Yes, okay. definitely. Gourds. What else? Pumpkins. Mm -hmm. Pumpkins and gourds and winter squash. So the... Um, Squash that you're eating is a kabocha squash, one of my favorite types of winter squash, um, but also other winter squash like butternut, um, acorn squash, uh, all those like the hardier thick skin squash, they last longer. Um, you can keep them for like a month or two, they're pretty sturdy. Um, and then cabbage is kind of a fall winter vegetable. Um, cauliflower, there's, you know, a few others. Mushrooms are pretty much always in season, but I think they work really nicely with fall and winter uh, recipes. But we have a lot to cook, so let's go ahead and jump in. Um, we're going to start with the uh, stuffed cabbage recipe. So um, it's kind of like a cabbage roll, but it's in one big form. Um, so cabbage rolls are often stuffed with like a ground meat or something and rolled up and baked and served with marinara sauce. So this is a vegetarian, um, actually vegan version that's made with mushrooms and we're also going to add some rice and lentils to make it a little bit heartier and a little bit stickier too. Um, if you're not a big fan of mushrooms, you could maybe use more of the lentils and rice. You could kind of stuff this with whatever you want, but this is just kind of the recipe um, that I'm using today. So the first thing you want to do is, um, I, I went ahead and did this already, but you take the cabbage and we're using Savoy cabbage, which is kind of like a fluffier, um, lighter cabbage mm -hmm. that's not as densely packed. This is just the inside of it. So the outside, it was about this big. The one that I bought was about a pound and a half. Um, it's kind of a light green on the outside. Um, and as you can see, the leaves are, they're kind of more decorative. Uh, they look kind of lacy when you bake them and then the, the vein part turns brown and crisp. Um, so it looks pretty. And it's just a little easier to work with than like a green cabbage, a little bit thicker, or these leaves are thinner than um, green cabbage. So uh, what you do is you pull off the leaves carefully, the outer leaves, and you want to save the, the outermost leaves for actually the bottom of the pan, because we're going to layer everything in the pan, and they're going to flip it out of the pan. So whatever is on the bottom is actually on the top. So you want to save, they're probably going to be the darker green leaves, you want to save those um, for the top here. So you pull off all the leaves, or pull off about 16 or so, so you don't run out. And what I do is I usually cut off a little bit of the end to loosen the leaves, and then I can carefully pull them off. And then as I get farther into the center of the head, I just keep cutting a little bit more of the stem off so that the leaves separate easily. Um, so then you take a big stock pot, fill it with water, add some salt, bring it to a boil, Throw these in there for two minutes just to soften them a little bit. They're going to keep cooking in the oven quite a bit. They're going to be in the oven for an hour, so they don't need to be really soft. They just need to be soft enough that you can work with them and fold them over. So then you um, just take them out. You don't need, really need to run them under cold water or anything, um, and then set them aside. So let's uh, now that that's done already, we will make um, the filling. So for the filling, um, I'm using lentils and rice, which I already cooked ahead of time, so about a cup of each. Um, these both freeze pretty easily, so if you have leftover rice from a meal, just freeze a cup of it, and then you can pull it out when you need it. Um, and then we're also going to fill it with 
um, celery, carrots, and onion. And we're gonna use a food processor to make this all a bit easier. So this recipe is a little more complicated than what we usually do in here. Okay, so we're gonna take carrots, one carrot, one stalk of celery, and um, how much onion? Uh, one small onion. I would say this half of a medium slash large onion is probably about the same size as one small one. You don't have to be exact with this recipe. Um, so everything's just gonna get all mixed together later. Okay. Um, let's see. Actually, first we're gonna do the garlic. So we need three cloves of garlic. And we're going to um, use the food processor to chop it up. So it's just going to make it a little bit easier. So um, we're going to put the garlic in first. Wow. Um, because if you put the garlic in later with the other bigger vegetables, it might be harder to finally dice it and you'll get big chunks of garlic. So you want to do it first so you can check it and make sure that um, it gets nice and finely diced. So I just push the knife down on it to loosen the skin. So we have three cloves of garlic. If you don't have a food processor, you can do this. It just might be a little bit more chopping by hand. But I'll show you uh, some short ones too. Okay, so now we're just gonna pulse it. <laughs> So like pulse with me, if you're not holding it down, you can kind of tap it to make sure that it's chopped. And you can see it there, hopefully. <laughs> it's like chopped, got chopped garlic. So it saves you a couple of steps. And then we're gonna um, also let the food processor do most of the work for the carrots and the celery. So I'm just gonna cut it into, you know, about an inch or so for each piece and just chuck it right in there. And then with the onion, I'm gonna take the skin off and then also just cut it into large chunks and process it more finely in the food processor. So you want everything kind of like finely chopped. Um, you don't want to puree it, you want a little bit of texture still. So in order to do that, we're gonna pulse it again. And you don't want to overfill your food processor because then the stuff on top will just float on the top and it will get chopped and everything at the bottom will just get pureed. So that will definitely come into play when we do the um, mushrooms too. Okay, so let's get our pan going. We're going to saute uh, the vegetables lightly to um, get them cooked a little bit, but again, they're going to continue to cook while they're in the oven. Okay, so we got a large skillet over medium heat, and we're going to add two tablespoons of olive oil. Just going to eyeball it. And um, then usually you'll be left with a little bit of cabbage. So I like to just throw some of it into the mixture as filler. I'm gonna cut, maybe I'll start with about half and I'm gonna cut out the core because that's pretty thick and I don't think anybody wants to eat that. And we're gonna measure about one cup. So I'm just gonna thinly slice it and we'll lightly cook it with the other vegetables. That's about half, or half, about one cup. So we'll just set the rest aside. Get the skillet hot first. Meanwhile, we can get everything else ready. So the spices that we're using are salt, pepper, dried thyme, and paprika. And you can use fresh thyme if you want. Usually the rule of thumb for um, converting from dried to fresh herbs is use three times as much when it's fresh. So when it's dry, it loses water, it's uh, more potent. So we're um, only using one teaspoon of the dried thyme. But thyme is one of the herbs that still holds on to a lot of flavor when it's dry. Um, thyme and oregano and rosemary. Other herbs like basil and parsley don't have a lot of taste when they're dried. So those tend to be better fresh. 
but I got no problem with dry time in this recipe. While we're waiting for the pan to heat up, we can also get the other vegetables ready. So we are using two types of mushrooms and that gives it a more interesting flavor. Shiitake, I think, have a little bit more flavor than just the you know, white button mushrooms or um, these brown kamini mushrooms. So um, we need to get these into smaller chunks and this is too much to put in the food processor all at once because the bottom will turn into mush. So what I do with the shiitake um, is I just kind of tear them up by hand. So it's one less thing that has to go through the food processor because you have to take the stems off anyway. The stems are pretty tough. So while I'm taking the stem off, I just kind of tear it into a few pieces. Then that way I don't have to bother to cut it or anything. So I went ahead and did that already with most of the mushrooms. So we're using a lot of mushrooms. These are, it's one pound of each. So I did some of these ahead, but honestly doing this is kind of therapeutic. So <laughs> it's worth the couple minutes that it takes. Okay. They're ready to go, and I think the pan is hot, so let's add our vegetables to the pan. So this mixture, um, not including the garlic, just the, the carrot, celery, and onion is known as mirepoix. Um, it's the a combination of those three vegetables, and it's often used as the start to a lot of foods and other recipes. And um, that's because they're pretty aromatic and give everything a nice flavor. And you'll probably be able to start to smell that in a minute or so. All right, so let's put, we're gonna put the food processor to work again and we're gonna process the mushrooms. I'm gonna do this in two batches just to make sure that I don't overfill it. And you could throw in the whole mushroom, but this will probably bounce around and not get chopped very easily. So I like to break these up a little bit too. And mushrooms are so soft that you can just kind of do it by hand. But um, what I actually like to do, since they have a little bit of dirt on the outside, a good way to clean them is just rubbing them with a towel. But then while you're at it, you can just use the towel in your hand to break them up into smaller chunks. Oops, I always draw some on the ground. Sorry about that. <laughs> that one flying. Okay, I need to pay more attention to what I'm doing here. Thank you. Now you should talk to me and ask, what do you get to do with the all the Roman was mushroom. Yeah. <laughs> we need a dog here. <laughs> That's, yeah, at home, my dog always picks up whatever I drop, so. If they like it. Yeah, maybe not so much mushroom reason. Not onions or garlic, right? Those are bad for dogs. Yeah. But my dog will eat the carrot peels and the cabbage scraps. Okay, so that's about half. <laughs> you don't um, wash my Um, They do absorb some of the water. They're like a sponge. Um, so if you are looking for something where you really want the mushroom to be really nice and crisp, then it's better to just wipe them with a damp towel. In this recipe, we're using so many mushrooms that that would be very time consuming to um, clean them all by hand. So, um, and, but I don't need them to be super crisp in this recipe. So what I did was I just quickly uh, ran a little bit of water in a colander and it's okay. So the shiitake, if you really soak them, if you squeeze it, like water will squeeze out, but they're still spongy, so they just have a little bit of water. So it kind of depends on, on what you're doing. These uh, mushrooms too, since there's so many, I um, similarly just quickly ran the water over it and then um, kind of dry them off with the towel as we go. Okay, so we're going to keep an eye on these vegetables. So we just want to lightly cook them. Again, they don't need to be cooked all the way, but we want to give them a chance to cook a little bit. And because we're stuffing something, you don't want to use a bunch of raw vegetables because vegetables are full of water. If all the water comes out, it's going to be a mess and it's not going to get crisp. So an important part of this recipe is to get 
the outside nice and crisp, and that's what's going to give it the nice finish, which you probably couldn't see on your samples because we cut it and just covered in marinara sauce. But that is part of the look, and that's what makes this like a, a nice recipe to put on your holiday table. Okay, so I think that's pretty good. Okay, these veggies and head start. And we're just going to um, mix everything up in a big bowl. And we're going to cook it in batches because, again, we need quite a bit of food in order to stuff an entire cake pan. So I'm just going to pop it in here. And, and add the seasonings, thyme, paprika, salt, and pepper, stir that up. And then we're gonna cook the mushrooms in batches. So we're gonna do a tablespoon of oil for each batch and another uh, half a spoon of salt and pepper. Oh yeah. It's just olive oil. I think it's actually um, this brand. It's from Berkeley Bowl, but there's a similar brand that I think makes wine. So they use wine bottles for their olive oil. Okay, so let's throw in all the shiitake. Again, it's about a pound. So we have a pound of those and a pound of the mini mushrooms. Uh, the first time I made this, I put too many mushrooms in the food processor and um, chopped them too small and the texture was not good. So make sure that you don't really go any smaller than that. And it's okay if there's some larger chunks. Everything's going to get cooked in the end. Really good. Thank you. <laughs> What's that? I enjoyed this. Oh, you did? Yeah, okay, good. Thank you. So delicious. So, uh, you know, by using kind of hand tearing the um, shiitake mushrooms, it will help make sure that the mushrooms still have some texture if you actually go a little too fine with the other mushrooms. And we're just gonna cook everything down a little bit. It doesn't have to be cooked all the way through, but mushrooms especially do have a lot of water. So we wanna cook some of that water up so it doesn't, uh, make the final product too mushy and watery. Oops, I forgot to put the cabbage in the other pan, so we'll just top it in there. And um, we can also add the rice and lentils to this big bowl here. Sister. And then also while we're waiting, we can start to get the pan ready to fill it up with all, all this goodness here. And let's do, we're going to process the rest of the mushrooms. <laughs> Good. And this food processor is pretty big. This is bigger than the one that I have at home. So if you have one, it might not be this big. So, you know, you might have to do three batches of, for each type of mushroom, um, which is takes a little bit more time, but I, I do think it's faster than chopping by hand. So in the end, it still saves you some time. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Let's add, we're gonna, we want to season all the layers of this dish. So we added some seasoning to these vegetables. We're gonna add some salt and pepper to each batch of mushrooms. And we cook the cabbage in salted water just to make sure that the, the flavor is evenly dispersed. So I'm just going to eyeball it. We only need about half a teaspoon. Okay, let's get the pan ready to stuff it. So you do want to grease the pan and make sure that it comes out easily. So I just use about a tablespoon of olive oil. I just pour a little bit in the pan. You can use butter too or vegan butter. And then just grease all around so that it comes out easily. 
my compost bowl there. Okay. Then, let me make it even see this. Okay. So again, we're gonna use the outermost sleeves first because they tend to be the biggest. The tab that I bought was a little bit on the small side. So you could buy a bigger one, like two, two and a half pounds. You're probably gonna have a little more left over from the inside. But you know, cabbage actually lasts a pretty long time in the fridge. So you could easily use it for another recipe. So I can tell these ones are the outside ones because they're greener and a little bit larger. And you want to leave some sticking up over the top because you're going to use that to seal it. So you don't want them to just go up to the rim of the pan. You want them to stick out a little bit. So all the way around. Yeah, that one's torn, so I'm going to use that on a different part. We'll go like that with the big ones. And then there's some little gaps, so I'm just going to use the smaller ones to fill it in. Why did you pick this type of cabbage as opposed to the regular? Uh, oh, okay. Um, so Savoy cabbage is often used for things like cabbage rolls because it's a bit more pliable than like a green cabbage. Um, and the finished product, I didn't get a great picture of it, but it will be nice and browned on the outside. And the Savoy cabbage has more pronounced veins. And it will give it kind of like a lacy finish when it's browned. Okay, so those mushrooms are almost done. This is ready to go. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put half of the mushroom filling on the bottom. And then I'm going to do a small layer of cabbage leaves that kind of makes it like a two layer cake. I mean, you can't really see it that well when it's cut because. It's just this layer of cabbage, it's very thin. Um, but I think it might also give it a little more structural integrity since it's kind of a bunch of mushy things going into a mold. Um, and then we're gonna put one, one more layer on top that will serve as the bottom of the cake and then we'll just fold everything over. So it's all kind of contained within the cabbage. And I like to get these mushrooms browned a little bit for some nice flavor. <laughs> You really can't overcook mushrooms, honestly. At a certain point, they, they don't get any smaller. Um, they just might get a little bit browner, so you don't have to worry too much about it. I think those are almost done. Let's go ahead and add the lentils and rice. So I cook these ahead of time. You can cook them separately, but what I usually do is I'll start the lentils in the pot with some water. Give them about a, a five minute head start on the rice and then uh, add the rice and some more water and then cook it for about 15 minutes. But it depends on what kind of rice you use. So, um, you know, check your the label or the um, package instructions because different types of rice and different, you know, lengths of rice take different amounts of time to cook. But this kind of helps act as a binding agent because the white rice is sticky. And the lentils are cooked, so they're a little bit sticky too. Um, but often, uh, ground meat types of like meatloaf, ducks, things have a little bit of egg in it as, that work as a binding agent. So you could add that, but what we're going to use is actually just a little bit of uh, oat flour. So this is just ground up oak, so you can buy it ground up already. I bought it in the bulk section at Berkeley Bowl. Um, you just pay for the weight. Or you can put some raw rolled oats in your food processor and just process it until it forms a flour. So if you think about how oatmeal is when it's cooked, it's kind of, you know, gooey, gummy. <laughs> But that's actually a property that we want in this case because it works as a binding agent. 
So about two tablespoons. I think it will probably work okay without it, but just to ensure that it has nice form, we're adding a little bit of that. All right, now we're gonna add the shiitake mushrooms and then we'll cook our last batch of mushrooms so we can get this thing stuffed. And you can feel free to try uh, other types of vegetables if you prefer to. Too. I mean, other types of mushrooms. Okay, so about a tablespoon of oil. And we'll throw in the rest of our mushrooms. Give them a stir. We'll give this a good stir, get a head start. Right, let's talk a little bit more about the recipe and I have to refer to my notes. There's a lot going on today. Okay, so cabbage, cabbage is a cruciferous vegetable. What other cruciferous vegetables are there? Mm -hmm. Broccoli, kale, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower. Yeah, a lot of them, they're, they're a little stinky when they're cooked. Um, it's actually a good thing that those are the um, sulfurous compounds, which may have anti-cancer properties. So um, so they're very nutritious and tasty, um, especially when roasted. You know, roasted broccoli, roasted cauliflower, roasted Brussels sprouts, they all get that nice little bit of crisp on the outside. So that's another reason why I like to use cabbage. In this recipe. Um, what else? So cabbage has fiber, vitamin C, vitamin K, and potassium, which is good for your blood pressure and heart health. And it's pretty affordable. So white cabbage is a little bit more expensive than green cabbage, but still pretty affordable. Oops, I tried the heat. And um, what else? Okay, I talked about, oh, savoy cabbage is a bit more tender and sweet than green cabbage, so it's not just the look and the texture, it's also the flavor works a little bit better in this recipe. It also stands up to longer cooker, longer cooking times. So some types of cabbage break down a bit more, um, but this one can stand up to, you know, an hour or so in the oven. Um, if Savoy cabbage is named for the Savoy region of France near the borders of Italy and Switzerland, where it was thought to have originated. So that's where the name comes from. Um, other types of cabbage are again green and red, uh, Napa cabbage, and there's actually over 400 other varieties of cabbage. Have you ever seen the, the cone shaped one? I saw it at the farmer's market once. There's the cone shaped cabbage. There's so many types of Every vegetable that you know of, there's like hundreds, if not thousands, of other varieties of it out there. We just don't always see them at the grocery store. Okay. Uh, I turned down the heat a little bit too much on there, so it's going to take a minute. Um, again, cabbage is that's, uh, available year round, but the winter versions tend to be milder and sweeter. So you can also find it in the spring, but it's a little tastier in the winter and fall. All right, let's give that a stir again. And then I'm gonna go ahead and add a little more salt and pepper. So again, about half a teaspoon of each. And I would taste the stuffing before you fill it because it's a little hard to season this recipe after it's cooked because it's all packaged already. But keep in mind that if you're going to serve it with the marinara sauce, that's going to add on some salt too. So you don't want to overdo the salt on the filling. Okay, that's going to take another minute or so, but we can keep going with our next recipe, which is a stuffing stuffed pumpkin. So I won't be able to show you the end product of either of these recipes because they require baking. So you can refer to your handout and see what it looks like. But um, again, we're using this kocha squash, um, one of my favorite types of squash. At, right after I bought it, I went to Berkeley Bowl. Um, this was one of the nicer ones that I could find. And then I went outside and they had more kombucha squash and they were a little bit taller and rounder, which I thought would have been really cute, but I had already paid for it. So that's okay. <laughs> um, the recipe calls for a three to four pound squash. This one is three and a half pounds. So 
you can see that eyeball it, you know, if you go to the grocery store, they have scales, so you can check the weight. But this is about the size we're looking for. Of course, you can go with a bigger one. It might just take a little longer to cook and you might need a little bit more stuffing. But with this recipe, the amount of stuffing that it calls for is more than what can fit in the pumpkin. But I like to have extra on the side because when you cut a slice of the squash, you only get like this little bit of stuffing, which in my opinion is not enough. So it's good to have some extra. And in this recipe, I'm just gonna use box stuffing, but feel free to use another recipe of your choice. Okay, so it might seem a bit extra to stuff the stuffing with stuffing. What I say, stuff a pumpkin with stuffing, <laughs> but it's honestly not that hard once you know how to cut it and just pre-cook it a little bit because it, uh, needs to cook about an hour or so, but you probably don't want to cook it that long with the stuffing in it. So you just pre-cook it a few. So for cutting the hole in it, the method that I like to use is just using a paring knife because then I can just make a bunch of small cuts in it and it will end up looking a bit rounder. And then if I use one big knife, it would look like an octagon probably, which is okay too, but it's also harder to go all the way through and cut to the bottom. So there's usually a bit of resistance. So I like to just use the paring knife. So I just kind of eyeball it and do one cut at a time, just going around the rim. And the outside of the squash is actually edible when cooked because it softens quite a bit. So you do want to make sure you give it a good wash before in case people want to eat the outside. But if you don't really like the outside of the pumpkin, then of course you can use skip eating that part too, which is honestly what I usually do. But if you like it, go for it. Okay. Almost done. Okay. So I cut all the way through. Um, I could hear it actually crack. So that actually came out right away, but sometimes it won't. So if it doesn't come out right away and it's stuck, what I do is I take a butter knife because it's a little bit safer and they're usually a bit thicker. Um, and I use it to kind of pry it out. And sometimes you have to go around a few times and kind of pry it a little bit, especially if you didn't cut all the way around completely. There might be like, uh, it's almost like it's perforated. And then you can use it to pry out the top of the squat. And I just cut out the extra stuff and then we're going to scoop out the insides. All right, I think this is ready. So we're going to add the rest of the mushrooms here and we'll come back to the pumpkin in a minute. All right, set that aside. I'm just going to put this on the floor and wash it later. Okay. Oops. This was not on the floor. It was in the pan. <laughs> okay. Stir that all up. Give it a taste. I'm not going to taste it. Um, I'm just going to want to take off the gloves. And we're short on time, so I think it's probably pretty good. Make sure everything's well combined. If you're using rice that you froze or refrigerated, it might stick together a bit, so make sure you break it all up. And we're going to fill half of the pan with the mushroom mixture. It doesn't have to be exact. So just make sure everything's still in place. You want the edges of the cabbage to be sticking up a bit so you can fold it over. And I'm just going to eyeball about half of it there. And then what you want to do is push it down into the edges of the pan, because for presentation's sake, you want to have those kind of crisp corners around the outside of the, I guess we'll call it a cake, for lack of a better term. So push it down into those corners so you get a nice edge. And kind of flatten it out a little bit. And then uh, maybe use the more torn leaves for the middle layer 
and save the more intact ones for the um, bottom, which will, or the top of the pan, which will then become the bottom. So then just use these leaves to create a second layer. It also adds a little bit of bulk to the pan. Um, you know, th there are quite a bit of mushrooms in here, um, which can be a little pricey. So, you know, feel free to use less mushrooms and more of other ingredients to kind of bulk it up. That's why I add the just, you know, a little bit of extra chopped cabbage just to kind of add some filler. Okay. Then the other half of the stuffing. Filling, I guess, call it. And if it doesn't quite fit in your pan, then um, you can just have a little extra on the side. The original recipe that I found was from the Food Network, and it was made in a souffle dish. And I thought, okay, I need to go get a souffle dish. Um, so then I thought about it, and I was like, I have these cake pans already. A lot of people have cake pans. And the souffle dish, I mean, that one, it took two hours to bake in the oven. Um, so I think this is just, it's not quite as tall as the big souffle dish, and it was like this tall, but I think it works just fine. It's a little bit more practical, and it, it cooks more quickly. Okay, so there's all the stuffing. And then we're going to put these leaves on. They don't have to be too pretty or perfect, because again, this is just going to be the bottom. It's just gonna help hold it, everything together when we go to cut it and serve it. And I had my leaves sticking out, but some of them sank down a little bit. So you can always kind of wedge a, another piece of cabbage in there to hold it together. So just push everything down. You don't have to really worry about squishing it. Everything's squishy already. And then cover it with foil. So that's what it'll look like. So you can see it fills up the whole pan. If you haven't, some people have eight inch cake pans, um, so you won't need quite as much filling. So you can either cut something out of the recipe or just you know have some extra. So um, that's what it'll look like. Cover it with foil and bake it for about an hour. Um, and then you you'll want to see that the edges have browned a bit. Once the edges are are pretty nicely browned, that means the top of it's probably browned. And if you um, take it out and it's not brown on top, you can always just put it on a pan, or you can might be able to put it back in this pan. Or if you have it on an oven-safe plate, you can put it under the broiler for a few minutes just to brown it. So then uh, when you're ready to serve it, what you would do is uh, take a plate like this, let it cool for a bit, um, but you might still want to wear pot holders. Um, just put the plate on top and then flip it over. <laughs> put the plate down and just gently shake it out. It should come out pretty easily. And then you'll see the nice presentation on top. And then you can cut it like a cake and serve it with marinara sauce. Okay, so back to the pumpkin. So you cut out the top. And then you're just going to take a spoon and scoop out the insides. I recommend using a spoon with kind of almost like a sharp edge. I have some spoons that are a bit thicker and they just don't really scrape the pumpkin that well. So you want something a little bit sharp. And if you don't quite get everything on the first try before you bake it, you can always scoop it a little bit more once after you kind of partially bake it because everything will be a little bit softer and easier to scoop out. But I, I scoop out the seeds and I really try to get all the stringy bits out because um, if, if they're still in there and then they get kind of wedged in with the stuffing and you eat it, the texture is not great. So I try to get all that stringy stuff out. And if it's too much to you know stuff the pumpkin and you don't want to uh, serve it that way, you could always just you know, cook the pumpkin separately and chop it up and, and have, you know, pumpkin stuffing that way. Already mixed together. Okay. The pumpkin won't really get infused with flavor because all the flavor is going to be in the stuffing. So I like to sprinkle a little bit of salt just to get some flavor in there. 
So we just need about half a teaspoon and uh, what I do is um, I hold the pumpkin and I just kind of, I don't know if you can see this, I just kind of shake it inside a little bit and rotate it so that it's covering, probably can't really see what I'm doing, but kind of covering a lot of it and then a little bit on the bottom. Then you can try to do this. I don't know if this will really help because salt's probably already absorbed. If you like cinnamon or other spices, you could also sprinkle some of those in at this point. So then you pop it in a pan with the lid and partially bake it for a half an hour to get it uh, softened a little bit while you make your stuffing. So again, for the stuffing, I'm just using a box kind. I used the one that was traditional bread stuffing, but um, for this batch, I thought I would use cornbread just to do something a little different. So we're going to get a big skillet and then preheat that. And um, we're going to use some butter, a quarter cup. This is actually vegan butter. You can use regular if you prefer. I really like this brand, Miyoko's. Hopefully you'll smell how good it smells and how good it tastes. And uh, it tastes pretty close to butter. So since I already cut into it, the markings are gone for the quarter cup, but I've done this so many times I'm just gonna eyeball it. Just about a quarter cup of butter. And then I went ahead and pre-chopped the vegetables. So we want about a cup each of onion and celery finely diced. So that's about two stalks of celery and one small onion or half of the medium or so sized onion. And what else do we need? Uh, broth. Okay. So we're going to use vegetable broth. And what I like to use, I talk about every single class pretty much, is this bouillon paste. It makes it really easy. It takes up hardly any room in your fridge. It lasts a long time. You just mix it with water. And one jar is equivalent to 38 cups of broth. It's a little jar. It's maybe buying one cup of salt. So um, it's easier than buying like cans or quarts, you know, boxes of broth. You can feel free to make it yourself at home too. But uh, for simplicity's sake, we're going to use this. And we need two and a half cups of broth. We might not need it all. It kind of depends on how much water your stuffing absorbs. Um, so one teaspoon of the bouillon paste gets mixed with each cup of water to make a cup of broth. I'm going to go a little bit lighter on the bouillon paste because it's pretty salty. Um, and so instead of doing two and a half teaspoons, I'm just going to go for two. And then we're going to add our water. And um, often you use eggs and stuffing, again, similar to the other stuff, uh, spilling for the cabbage, um, it makes it sticky. So you can use egg, but um, you can also use cornstarch. So cornstarch can kind of work as like a sticky sort of binding agent. Um, so I'm just going to use that. It's also really affordable. If you run out of eggs, you know, this will work in a pinch. But if you want to make it totally plant-based, then this is the way that you can do it. So we need two tablespoons. And if you've cooked with cornstarch before, you probably know that you usually mix it in with water to create a slurry, and you don't want to add it hot to anything. So it'll just cook and clump up. So we're going to um, combine it like this before we add it. But it also settles easily at the bottom. So anytime you make a uh, cornstarch slurry for a recipe, make sure you give it another stir before you add it to the pan just to reincorporate it. Okay, so butter is melted. Add the veggies. And um, similarly, these are gonna continue to cook once they're in the pumpkin. So we just want them to be tender crisp. We don't want them to be fully cooked. Otherwise they'll be really overcooked by the time they're done. So just a few minutes in the pan. Okay, so that crop and cornstarch is ready to go. 
I told you this already. So uh, for this recipe, I'm using 12 ounces of stuffing, which is a pretty common measurement. You might also be 14 ounces, um, but it really doesn't have to be exact because whatever is left over, you're just going to uh, bake it in another pan. So for the leftover, I usually use a loaf pan. I just grease it with a little bit more of the butter and then put the leftover in there and put foil over it and then bake it with pumpkin. Um, once everything's stuffed, in case you run out of time, um, cook both of them for about half an hour and then take off the foil from the extra pan of stuffing and bake it for another 10 minutes so it gets crisp on top and then it should be all ready to go. But you also want to check the pumpkin to make sure it's done because if it's underdone, there's not really much you can do once it's already cooked. So usually what I do is just take a little paring knife like this and uh, it. And I'll just stick it in here and it should just kind of go in easily. There will be some resistance because it's still like a pretty hearty vegetable. Um, but that will be a good indication of like, it being done. And uh, when I made this the first time, it was actually around Halloween. And I made it with my brother. And after it was cooked, she said, oh, let's put a little face in it. So that was my brother's idea. So if you want to do this, I know Halloween just passed. But next year, once it's cooked, it's really easy to carve into it. So he just took a little paring knife and did a couple of triangles for the eyes and a little mouth. And it looks actually really cool because it's so dark green on the outside and orange on the inside. Um, so you can have some fun with it or get creative and do other patterns for the other holidays. All right, so once this everything starts to get a little translucent, it's probably good to go. It's You don't really want to get it to the point where it's brown because then it's pretty well cooked. So maybe just another minute or so. And then what we're going to do is add the stuffing to the pan and then the broth just enough to get it coated. Um, once it's squishy, you don't want it to be too wet. Do you have a question? Oh, thanks. Okay. So that looks pretty good. Let's put our stuffing in the pan. And we'll give it a stir. You can also use a stock pot or a Dutch oven for this to have a little bit more space, but I thought it'd be kind of hard to see in the class, so I'm just using a skillet for this. Okay, again, we're gonna give this a little stir to redistribute the cornstarch. And don't pour it all in at once because you might not need it. You can kind of use some of your other senses to tell when things are ready. Um, in this case, using the sense of sound. So I don't know if you can hear that's kind of scraping on the pan. That's the dry bits, right? So once you stop hearing the scraping, that means that everything's pretty well soaked through. It will also, I mean, probably depends on the type of stuff you use, but it'll be kind of spongy when it's ready. But you don't really want to see extra liquid at the bottom. So that means there's probably a little bit too much. but it does depend on the type you use. So I can't tell you the exact amount of liquid. And I'm not gonna stuff the pumpkin because I didn't pre-cook it yet, but um, hopefully you get the idea. So that's kind of squishy and it's not scraping anymore. So I think that's good to go. And then I just serve it with a simple mushroom gravy. I just saute a little bit of sliced mushrooms, a clove of garlic, put about a tablespoon for a, a small batch, um, a tablespoon of flour, and then um, what did I do? A cup of broth. So saute the mushrooms first, sprinkle the flour over, add a little more butter, and then mix the broth in and then just cook it until it thickens a bit. So a really simple recipe. And I think that's all we have time for. Uh, well, maybe really quick, I'll tell you a little bit more about the squash. Um, I've talked about nutrition in these classes. Um, like other winter squash, it's rich in antioxidants and vitamin C and vitamin A. has a lot of fiber um, and also potassium, which again is good for your heart health. And uh, in terms of the taste, it has a sweet, nutty flavor. 
And it kind of tastes like a cross between um, other types of pumpkin and sweet potatoes. I, I think it's a nice uh, mild flavor. So I, I really like it personally. All right, so let's do the raffle. Does everybody have their raffle ticket? 